recently done an inventory of the Kansas River, and so they're going to talk about the 2008 inventory of the Kansas River, and Laura Caldwell will uh, start the presentation. And uh, next Thursday at 4 o'clock, there's a special seminar, and so I uh, pass that out to those of you who I've uh, had a chance to do that to, and wanted to encourage you to go and listen to that as well. Laura, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And I'm the Kansas Riverkeeper. This is Cynthia Nett, and she's our scientific advisor. And she's going to tell you a little bit about... Just a little bit of bookkeeping. Um, I set up a website for you guys. And I'll flash the address on larger. But it's cynthia.annette.googlepages.com slash KSU Sustainability Center. And if you go there, I put together a whole bunch of for those of you who might be interested in doing careers in natural resource management, I put links to all the agencies and to different things you might be interested in, to doing any projects that might be interesting to you. Um, one of the pages has the PowerPoint we'll be giving, and so this is just for you guys. So you can go to the website if, if you're interested. And I've got, it's linked to a couple of other lectures on water too, but that's your lecture. <laughs> oh, technology. Second. Yeah, and, um, Here's the URL, cynthia.net.googlepages.com slash KSU Sustainability Seminar. And for those of you who might be familiar with Google Pages, they just moved over to um, a, a different program, but it's, it's a really easy to do program, and it's free. So if you want to set up your own web pages, this is a good way of doing it. Um, there's my email address and Laura's email address. Feel free to email us. If you have any questions or if there's anything we can do for you. And the um, KansasRiver.org, that's the main website for the Friends of the Caw. And Laura and I have been doing a lot of work on it. So there's a lot of resources there. We've got Kansas River Atlas that we're building that has a lot of information. And Laura will talk more about that. But, but the lower website is your own website. And the KansasRiver.org is the Friends of the Caw website. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Dr. Erickson for having us here tonight. And um, Cynthia put together the PowerPoint, so which is great because I can do it, but she did a better job. Um, so I, I really appreciate her. Um, yes, well, I appreciate her her contribution to tonight's class. And I, I so I will keep that up. But I want to tell you a little bit about Friends of the Caw. We are a not-for-profit, grassroots environmental organization, and our mission is to protect and preserve the Kansas River for present and future generations. Um, we, we actually organized in about 1993, about 15 years ago. Um, we incorporated in 1997, and in uh, 2001, we, became, we uh, became a chapter of the Waterkeepers Alliance. And that is an international water protection organization. Um, it was started and it's headed by Robert Kennedy Jr., who's done many, many good things for the environment. Um, and I am allowed to, to use the name Riverkeeper because we are, it's a trademark name with the Waterkeepers Alliance. And um, the Waterkeepers Alliance, we have about 182 keepers around the world. Granted, there's a, a huge cluster on the east and west coast of the U.S., um, and there's lake keepers, bay keepers, coast keepers, um, just a generic water keeper, creek keeper, river keepers. So, so but keeper is kind of the key word. Um, and uh, so we are a member of that organization. And to me, um, Having the title, I'm the only person in the world that's the Kansas River Keeper, so that's kind of cool. 
And I think it's a really um, a wonderful PR tool because when people hear about the Kansas Riverkeeper, oh, that's so cool, what do you do? And um, my main responsibility is I'm the eyes, ears, and, um, and I'll say voice of the <laughs> Kansas River. I never can get that. Um, what is it? Ombudsman for the Kansas River. And my main responsibility is um, watching out for the river. Um, we do, if there's a comments that need to be made to one of the agencies like Kansas Department of Health and Environment or EPA, I do those kind of things. Um, we also have an 800 number, which is 866 Riv Keep, and that's our pollution hotline. Um, so we advertise, we like folks to, if they see something going on in the Kansas River Valley near the river that they feel like is a pollution problem, you're welcome to, to call, and I, of course, answer the phone. And um, many times I'll go out and do some of my own investigation. Um, certain cases I'll actually hire a plane and fly over and take pictures of what's going on, document the situation, turn it into the proper agency, and then work through the mediation problem of fixing the pollution on the river. Um, many times I just help the caller identify who they need to call and get them the proper number so they might call Kansas Department of Health and Environment. I mean, occasionally I tell people they need to call 911. We need to get hazardous material team out there. But that's my main job. Um, I also guide float trips on the Kansas River. And um, we basically, we pretty much um, specialize in group float trips. So we need 16 to 24 people. Um, and then we have a trailer of canoes. And, and we actually guide people down the river. Um, we do a little hot dog roast, hot dog and marshmallow roast on a sandbar. And truly, the sandbars are one of the most beautiful parts of the Kansas River. It's like being on the beach in the middle of Kansas. Um, we, and we also do a little sandbar seminar. Um, it's probably one of our best public outreach tools are our, are our float trips. Um, you know, I do a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day things for my organization, fundraising, grant writing. So it's... <laughs> A broad, a broad job, do many, many things. Um, a little bit, um, and what we're going to talk about tonight is the Kansas River inventory. And I want to give you a little background on this. Um, our, my organization um, formed in 1993 um, because the um, industry was wanting to commercially mine sand and gravel out of the Kansas River above Lawrence. And that's a fairly pristine section of the river. A group of North Lawrence folks started the organization and fought that. And um, I'm not going to talk a lot about, about dredging, but we do believe that sand, most sand dredging is, happens between Lawrence and Kansas City, um, and also in the Topeka area. Um, but it does a great deal of damage to the bed and the banks of the Kansas River. And so we have been, that's been our, our kind of our flagship issue that we have worked on for the past 15 years. Uh, when we started in 1993, there were 22 dredge sites or dredge permits on the Kansas River. Um, now there are only 10, and of those, only about six are active. So, and we're still working to. And, and our, what we would like to see is we would like to see those operations move off river into a, a pit mine in the Kansas River Valley. Um, that's, uh, th there are some environmental problems with that, but we think it's, it's a be much better solution than, um, than dredging sand on the Kansas River. And they use sand to build highways, hot, you know, houses, commercial. So sand is needed but we don't think it's a good idea to take it from the river. Um, so in this, in this process to um, advocate against sand dredging, um, we, we um, worked with the state to actually form a technical advisory committee on Kansas River channel degradation. This was a pretty big deal. It took a lot of political clout. We had to work with a lot of different um, government agencies to get this going. And um, it was approved. Um, and as we started looking at some of the problems on the Kansas River, and 
Um, oh, I didn't talk. I want to talk a little bit more about the Kansas River before I go on. Um, this is a, our access map. I'm going to move it up here so you can see it a little better. But the Kansas River um, actually starts in Junction City, really close to you. And it's the confluence of the Missouri and the, the uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the Republican and the Smoky Hill River. And it runs 171 miles, kind of zigzagging eastern way across the state to, to um, Kansas City, Kansas, where it dumps into the Missouri. So that's a little background on that. And this is my river access map. So if you'd like to look at it afterwards and we can talk about that, that would be fun. We just put in a, at help, one, the city of Wamego put a boat ramp in under the 99 bridge. And we'll be working with Junction City to put a ramp in uh, very soon. So that's another project that we And the ramp at Wamego is my personal favorite. So if you haven't been down there, you should check it out. The access from the Blue River, is that what you're talking about? Um, in Wamego? Yeah, because there's one right near Wamego where you get on the Blue, and then that feeds into the Kansas. I, uh, well, that's here in Manhattan. Yeah. And, um, and there's that one that's been there for many years. And then just a couple years ago, they put an access actually on the Kansas River under the 177 bridge. But that, uh, Riley County did that. But, but we're thrilled to have the, those accesses because the more people you get, it's a wonderful recreational resource. It has not been widely used. But with the cost of gas, it's, it's, it's great. You know, you don't have to drive to Missouri or Colorado. You can, you can just hopefully run a boat and get on the river right in your own backyard on a Sunday afternoon. That's very nice. OK, anyway, I've got to get back to the topic about um, the Kansas River inventory. Um, and one of the things that came out of this meeting of this technical advisory committee, and they had committed people from a lot of the different agencies, from the Division of Water Resource, the Corps of Engineers, um, EPA, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, the, the um, Water Office, a lot of um, agencies among that are federal and state. They also have stakeholders on this committee. And I, I as the Kansas Riverkeeper, was appointed also um, the, the, the um, lobbyist for the sand dredgers was, was, is, was my counterpart on the committee. But one of the things that the scientists decided was they didn't have enough information, physical information, about the Kansas River to really make any decisions on why it was degrading, what to do about it. And they do have, in the regulatory plan for sand dredging, that industry has to monitor the river where they are sand dredging, where they're actually taking sand out of the middle of the river. Um, so do you all understand what sand dredging is? Yeah, they actually they actually have a machine that sucks the sand out of the bottom of the river and the water. And they separate that on the bank, return the water to the river, and then they sell the sand. But it's a big industry. Um, but they, this committee decided that they didn't have enough, dis, didn't, didn't have enough information to um, make these decisions about the Kansas River. And so the state actually is, uh, has put a little money behind it. And they are doing what's called cross sections. Um, the dredgers do those cross sections where they dredge. But really, there was no baseline, in the baseline on the Kansas River. So they are doing a cross section about every four and a half miles from Junction City to, um, to Topeka, and then from Topeka to Lawrence. They're doing these cross sections. And what they do is they, they put a permanent marker on each side, up on the bank, on each side of the river. And then they have their little machines. They do cross sections. Then they measure the width of the river. They measure the depth of the river. And then they will go back every, several, every couple of years and do that again. So they have an idea of what if the river's getting wider, if it's getting deeper, if it's getting shallower, narrower, so they can, they can track those, those um, they can track those statistics and start making some um, educated decisions about the river. Um, another area, I mean, very little was known about the river from Junction City to Topeka, um, about where the physical structures are where um, wastewater treatment outlets were, where water intakes were, 
where bank stabilization um, attempts were made. And so Friends of the Caw decided, well, maybe that is where we can contribute. So we, um, I've been working on this project for about four years, but last year and this year, we actually, with, in kayaks, we paddled the 171 miles of the river and took this data. Um, okay, moving on. Um, and this, this shows you, this is that Kansas River watershed. And um, it's the size of Ohio. Um, it's about 53,000 square miles. Um, but there's some things, um, and, and we wanted to learn about the land use practices and how they impact the Kansas River. And the Kansas River does have some point source problems, and that's um, discharges that come through a pipe to the river. Wastewater treatment plants are a point source discharge. Um, an industrial like Procter & Gamble has a plant on the river and they have a discharge to the river. These are all monitored by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, all the point source discharges. Actually, the dredging industry have point source discharges because they are, they are um, putting the water back in the river that they took out. Then we have the problem of non-point source pollution, and that's pollution from runoff. And that is agricultural pollution, so it would be herbicides, pesticides, um, fertilizers, animal waste from confined um, animal feeding operations. Uh, that that um, brings pollution into the river. So that's another thing we're looking at. And then sedimentation, and I think um, that's a big problem in Tuttle Creek. Are you aware of that? Um, the Blue River is depositing an awful lot of sediment in Tuttle Creek, and because of the dam, it's just it's making the lake smaller. It's kind of becoming a muddy bog up at the top, and so there's not a, as much storage space for water um, or usable recreation space. But those are some of the problems that um, the Kansas River is facing. Um, and the probability of flood events and dewatering, which means when we have really high rains, what happens to the river, or when the river gets really low, what's, what happens, so happens to the river. So those are some of the things that we are considering as we're doing the inventory. And this is a little closer look at um, the Kansas River watershed. Um, like I said, um, the Caw drains 53,000 square miles size of Ohio. Um, there is a lot, and you notice here, the green is grassland and the beige is cropland. So we have, you know, probably, you know, about half and half, maybe a little bit more grassland than cropland. But a lot, that, that the grassland is where the um, grazing operations are for cattle, hogs, and then the cropland, of course, is where they're um, growing uh, crops. So there's a lot, we, a lot of uh, potential for the non-point source pollution. Um, and then also, this there's about um, 6,000 miles in Colorado of the Kansas River watershed, and there's um, 30, uh, 11,000 square miles in Nebraska. So any, the water starts there and it all comes. Here's Junction City and here's the main stem river running right there. Um, <coughs> so it, it's a real, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you was the Kansas River is the longest prairie-based river in the world. Um, and a, and a prairie-based river, the Kansas River starts out in the prairie and flows all the way down to the Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas, rather than the, um, the Kansas River starts in, in uh, I believe, Leadville, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And so it's a mountain. It's actually from the mountain, starts in the mountain. Okay. Are we ready to move on? No. So, 
Okay, and I'm going to let Cynthia talk a little. Oh, there you go. Okay, here's our next one. Um, and one of the things that um, we were looking at is um, the uh, riparian zone. And that is the trees and the vegetation that grow along the banks. And how the impact from land use practices can influence that, whether it's good or bad. Um, we actually inventoried where there were healthy riparian corridors and where there were not. Um, and because where there are not healthy riparian areas, that's where you get a lot of sedimentation. Because when it rains, that this, the dirt, the clay, the sand just comes right into the river. Um, you get a lot of land loss from that, cut, <coughs> and the pollution from runoff. Um, some of the solutions we're investigating, um, and, and this is not something that we're inventing, it's something that's out there, but to develop best practices for landowners um, to try and make these landowners understand how important it is to have the healthy riparian zone to the river and to themselves, and then um, hopefully work on incentives and get some state and federal programs to make sure the riparian zone along the river and the tributaries to the river are healthy. And Cynthia's going to talk a little bit about this slide. This is from a paper from one of your professors, Dr. Wayne Geyer. And in 1993, one of his master's students took the data, took aerial photographs like the ones that Laura showed you, and looked at I don't know how many of you remember the 1993 flood, but it was my first year <laughs> in Kansas, and it was a big one. I was uh, brand new in Lawrence, and I had my students in downtown Lawrence with Sane, Sane catfish out of the parks. It was flooded so badly. Well, they, they took the aerial photographs before and after the flood. This was a 500-year flood event, and looked at, at where along the banks through this reach of the river there was loss of land, and if there were any places where land was actually gained, so that it would be actually added to it. So this line right here is the baseline. So this is, if nothing happened, it would just be right here. These are, land is added, these are land is removed. Okay, it just so happens that this area where there was actual deposition, the farmers gain some extra land are areas where there was a healthy forest. This one right here, there was a little bit of, of deposition. This is where there's a single line of trees, so even a few trees helped. This is area where it was grassland, and this is area that was cropland. So you can see during a catastrophic flood, there was a tremendous amount of erosion in croplands. The amazing thing is there was actually deposition in forested areas. Other research has also shown that where there's forest between a river and dikes and levees, the levees are less likely to fail. So in areas like you'll see in some of our slides, like in Topeka, where the river is right up against the levees, there's more of a possibility of those levees failing. In areas like through sections of Lawrence, where there's a nice, thick, healthy riparian zone between the river and where um, the levees are, the trees will help to stabilize that bank and there will be less likelihood of the levees failing. Thank you. Okay, so if the healthy riparian zone is the key to erosion control and removing impacts on the river, is the car riparian zone healthy? And I would say it's probably about a 50-50 deal. Um, and, you know, a, sometimes landowners will remove the trees along, along the river because they think that's going to add crop land or, for, or they're going to harvest them and sell them the timber. Um, and, and we don't think that's a very good idea. We would like to get some more information out so people don't do that. But sometimes the river just cuts and it takes those trees, pulls, the, pulls that, um, 
that riparian forest off the bank and just leaves the cropland. So it isn't all, it's, sometimes it's nature that does it and sometimes it's humans. Um, now, um, that we, we've, done, we've done this inventory twice. Uh, well, I've, I've done some practices, but in 2007, last year, we were going to do the 171 miles at one time, but there was so much, the water was so high that we had to keep postponing it. And so what we ended up doing was taking the inventory uh, on different weekends all throughout the summer. So we pretty much have recorded the Kansas River in high water in 2007. This year, we decided, well, we don't want to have to run into that again. So we plan to do the inventory the last week in, in um, July and the first week in August and pretty hot but we figured the water be low so that we could get the data at a, at a different river level and um, this is day one day one where we're packing our kayaks at Grants Park in Junction City and, and that guy's in it yes <laughs> this he was is our big Cynthia and, and, and this is Jim Dr. Steichen, and he was one of our shuttle drivers that day. We appreciate that. He's also a board member of Friends of the Caw. Myself, um, and then this is uh, Chip Farley and R.J. Stevenson, and um, they, they came to help us take data. But we started in Junction City on Saturday, July 26th. Um, we went about 20 miles a day, which is a pretty long day. Um, and so that was the first day. The second and we got to just before Manhattan um, on July 27th we got to around St. George Kansas um, on the Monday the 28th we woke up to thunderstorms all around us and when you're on a sandbar in a tent <laughs> and the only way you have to get off the sandbar is a kayak thunderstorms are not lightning is not a good thing so we kind of waited around until that it subsided a little bit and paddled the five miles into Wamigo. Um, we had planned a rest stop into me, in Wamigo because we had, to, we had to take off about every two or three days so we could charge our camera batteries, our phone batteries, um, you know, get, a, get, get water, get more food, get away from the river for a few hours. And we were thinking it would be really hot, so it would be nice to get into some air conditioning. But when we stopped in Wamigo, and that is when Dolly, Hurricane Dolly, kind of came and settled over Manhattan and Kansas. So we, had, we, we decided to take out that day, and we were out the next day, Tuesday, because of the rain. And then we put back in on the river on Wednesday and went from Wamigo to the Maple Hill Bridge. So, yeah, so I wish I had a laser for him. There's Wamigo, and there's the Maple Hill Bridge. Um, the next day, we went from, from Maple Hill just to the outskirts of Topeka. Um, then the next day, we went through the city of Topeka from here to here. Um, August, on August 2nd, we went to Lecompton, here to here. The next day, we went on into Lawrence. The next day, we went to... Um, about to Soto, and then the next day we went to Edwardsville, um, and we have, well, we do have yet to do from Edwardsville to Cop Point, but it got started getting rainy and lightning again, so we decided not to do that. And the things that we used, um, we have a GP a camera that ha that is GPS enabled, so when you take a picture, it takes that data in the file, the date, and all that. So we had a, um, a GPS camera. This is R.J. Stevenson, and he was our official photographer. And one of the things we would do is we would take a photograph downriver of every river mile so that um, we, can doc we can just kind of document what the terrain is in that mile. Um, and then we had, we had our clipboards. Um, I, I did bring my raw data if you want to take a look at it. But we copied the Corps of Engineer maps onto um, to, um, waterproof paper, and then we took space pens and wrote all our data. Because sometimes it, 
it got wet just because you were in the river or because it was raining. Um, so we took, and the data we, we would mark down um, any uh, physical structure. We would mark down bank stabilizations. Go back to the other one. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Yeah, go back one. So, he, so, so that's kind of, here Cynthia's got her clipboard, and this is myself doing my little data. Okay, so what we would mark down on our sheets were uh, erosion and drainage. So where there was a big vertical cut of 10 to 20 feet on the bank, we definitely marked that on our maps. Um, if there was a, that's a uh, agricultural tile, so we marked those things. Um, where there, there was no growth, where, which is cropland or grass sun came up, we would mark that. Um, we would mark where bank st stabilization was, and sometimes that was, um, d you could tell it was done by the Corps of Engineers or some entity like that, and it was either, uh, and you could, you could see where there's, those jetties were placed in the river. Sometimes it was just junk left kind of in a place that was eroding. Um, sometimes it was car bodies. Um, sometimes it was tires. Um, and, and this is concrete rubble. Now, um, today, the only legal bank stabilization you're seeing is the concrete rubble. And really, it has to be crushed finer than that. That is illegal bank stabilization. Um, we marked where there was head cutting. And this is just upstream from a sand dredge. And when they dredge, pull sand out of the river, what happens is the river wants to repair itself. So it goes upstream and it starts pulling soil, clay, and sand from, from the river bank, pulling that repairing forest in and pulling that down to fill the hole. Um, so we recorded where there was head cutting. Um, and this is showing some of the sand dredging operations. Uh, not very aesthetic along the river. The, the pictures with the beautiful, you know, repairing corridor, you know, it's, it's very nice to canoe along these sections. To me, these are eyesores, plus they're causing damage. Um, so we're, we, that's one of the reasons we want to see them do something a little different. Um, and this is a picture that I took several years ago, but you can see the discharge coming, it it's, was pure black. Um, and we reported that to Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, this is kind of what a dredge looks like. It's a, it's, a, it's a machine that sets on pontoons and it has this big chainsaw that they lower into the river and it just augers up the, the bottom of the river and that is sucked up onto a land operation and they separate the sand and gravel and then return the water to the river. So those pipes with the black coming out, that was returning river water. And that, um, that was, to have black water coming out is not a good thing. Okay. Um, we also um, documented where the bridges were and where bridges once were. Um, this is a, rail, a railroad bridge on a tributary in this picture. Um, and then this is in Topeka. And they're on the uh, Topeka Avenue Bridge. They had a, an earthen dam underneath that we had to portage. And that was interesting. But we got across and moved on. We also, um, we also documented where there were power lines going across the river, also gas lines going under the river. Um, we documented um, where the power plants were. And in the ones that use the Kansas River are Jeffrey's Energy Center that's just west of here, just east of here. Um, there's a small um, plant in Tecumseh, in Topeka, on the east side of Topeka. There's a, the Lawrence Energy Center, which is just outside of Lawrence. And then there's also um, the Board of Public Utilities has um, a power plant on the Kansas River in Kansas City. Um, the day that we were going through Topeka, this is called a coffer dam, and they build that to protect the water intake for Topeka. It diverts the water across the river so they can take it out. But we had to portage this, obviously. So, um, so 
we had some help, some helpers come, and so this was a pretty good action shot. <laughs> Um, we also um, documented outfall. This is a sewage treatment um, outfall in Lawrence. Um, this is a storm sewer outfall in Topeka. Um, and this is another one coming under a train bridge. And then we also, on the trip this year, we took water samples. And we tried to take water samples down from each, um, from wastewater treatment plants, yes. Um, in the bottom left photo, is it because there are grain? Is it a grain grain silos there? Um, the well, there, it, but it's just um, to discharge water that that runs in the city. This isn't. I don't think this really has anything to do with the drain side, the silos. But it's just you know, as, and when it rains, they collect the water and then they dump it back into the river, off and this just kind of shows what it looks like. Pardon? Off the streets and parking. Yeah, lots. off the streets, parking lots, that kind of thing. Um, and at the end of the, so, so we did do some water testing. Um, we took about 35, 40 samples and actually field tested them, kept the results. Um, and then this is the 11th day, pretty hot day that day. So we were kind of glad to get off the river. But here we, this is in Edwardsville. And we lost one of our team, uh, one of our team members during the float due to some family we didn't actually lose him. He no. left. He, thank you. He him. We didn't lose him to drowning. He had to go home. So, um, so it was just the three of us. But we were actually on the river 11 days, and then we did backcountry camping on the river eight nights. And um, this is are some of the outcomes that we would like to see. Um, we will advocate for policy changes and incentives to improve land use and riparian management for the sake of a healthy river. Um, what we're trying to do is to develop an online database, to develop online maps with GPS photos, um, to provide data to agencies and to the public. So we want this to be publicly accessible. And we'd like to use it for um, landowner outreach to educate people about healthy riparian zones along the river. Um, very soon, and our, our website is kansasriver.org, and we're, we're working to get those photographs on Google Earth and get that on our website. So folks that say want to recreate on the Kansas River, they can go to the section of the river that they're going to go on, and they can actually look at the photos of the river. So I think that will be very useful just for the general public. Um, and we did get some um, PR along the way. We got a couple stories in the Lawrence Journal World. Um, when we stopped under the 177 bridge in Manhattan, uh, Channel 27 from Topeka came and interviewed us. And they, they had a little story on the 10 o'clock news. And then we've also had um, some some uh, articles in the Lawrencean, which is a local Lawrence paper, and um, there will be also one in the pitch in Kansas City. And this is, this is the Google map that we're working on, so we hopefully will have that on our website very soon so people can actually see some of the pictures that we took. And since the camera has the GPS coordinates in it, all you have to do is upload them and they automatically get put into the right location. And that's one of the really valuable things. Because that was one of the things I discovered as I was doing my practice. I would take a picture and then I would record the GPS location, but it was really hard to know how they went together. And I, th I thought that uh, error was very likely. So having that camera is critical. And I do encourage you to go to our website. It's a wealth of information. Um, we have targeted this so that folks who don't know a lot about water quality can go there and read it and understand it and get something from it. Um, we have spent the, Can the Kansas River Atlas, and you can link to the Kansas River Atlas here and also up at the top. And um, the sections that we, we have a thing with the sections. Uh, no, this one. Okay. Um, but we, oh, I have it on here. We have, um, I think, But we have, um, we have 
a section on, it's called Areas of Concern, and that uh, documents point source, where there are point source discharges on the Kansas River. We have a section that talks about, that's called um, Pollution from Runoff, that discusses um, non-point source pollution. We have a section on sand and gravel dredging that talks about what happens when they um, dredge sand and gravel from the river. It actually shows the different permits and what the river looks like there. Um, we have a new section on there called um, Life on the Caw, and that uh, uh, um, deals with historic and cultural sites. So it's got a lot of wonderful pictures. It talks about some of the history of the Caw, the Oregon Trail, those type of things. Um, we're, we are going to add a new section very soon called Where You Live and Work that will we'll talk about things that businesses, homeowners, landowners can do to protect their water quality. And we also just got funding for, um, for kids for the CAW. So we're going to develop a kids corner that's very interactive. Um, we're also going to develop sandbar schools so we can take um, kids from boys and girls clubs or um, upper elementary middle school kids actually out on a sandbar and, and try and interest them in science. So, you know, we'll do sand castle building. We'll talk about what happens when water goes down the river. Um, have some naturalists come talk about mussels, do a little water testing. So we're really excited about that. Um, do we have one more slide. And this is an aerial picture. What does a healthy river look like? Should the caw be forced into a stable channel, or should the natural processes be allowed to occur? So should the caw be connected to its floodplains? Um, and um, there's been, they're doing a lot of study on this now. The Missouri River above Kansas City has been extremely channelized. And so it's made the river, they've taken out a lot of the bends that were naturally there and made it straight. And what's happened is now the river runs much faster through those areas and it's down cutting the bank or, or the, cha the channel. And so it's, it's not, and in places like Kansas City, the water intakes are now starting to be coming close to being out of water. So, so it's, it's an important thing um, to talk about, um, you know, people can't live without clean water. And in the state of Kansas, we get, well, in the, in, most, in Northeast Kansas, many of the river communities get their drinking water from the Kansas River. So it's really important to our future and our lives. Um, I know there's a big aquifer running in, like, in, in this area. The park. I thought we get most of our water from the groundwater. Um, in some places they do. That's in, in western Kansas, the Ogallala Aquifer. Yeah. And it is being pumped for irrigation, which is not good. Um, yeah, and this is a uh, video taken, and, and you can see the two eagles. Um, and we're actually on a float trip here. Yeah, we'll start it again. We're actually um, on a float trip. This was done several years ago. Uh, Dr. Steichen was with us. Oh, we'll be on in a minute. Um, but we, uh, we, and Cynthia was on that float, but we had a, a really nice video of um, the float trip and eagles flying right next to us. So. It's, it's neat. Huh? It's neat. Yeah. But, yes. What were the results of your uh, water sampling? Um, I have them right here, and we really, um, there was some fecal coliform in the water, probably a little elevated, but it had just rained. Um, we did take two samples directly from a pipe discharging to the river. And those two samples were pretty, weren't, weren't very good. They didn't test out very well. But we tested for um, pH, nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, phosphorus, and E. coli. So obviously, like, the phosphorus and the nitrates were high, but um, the remnants of like, DDT still in that river? Well, we didn't test for that. But, um, and I think the shelf life on DDT has pretty much gone away. The biggest problem in the river is uh, PCBs. Yeah, there are things that are easy to test for using simple test kits, and then there are things that require considerably more work. What Laura was interested in 
was Sorry. being able to use the simple tests to identify hot spots to then have the agencies go in and, and look at some more. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. About that uh, that dredge operation where they they were polluting, did they ever get did they ever get tested and see if um, in the regulation? Well, you wish they would. But um, Kansas Department of Health and Environment did respond to me. They said, well, that day they were dredging through a mud bar. And so it was the, the discharge was very muddy. But they don't, they're not doing that anymore. So they didn't really get in trouble for that, no. Because I know, like, with the EPA, they have um, a, a monitor, like, at the end of some things that can't be tampered with and touched. Yeah. And so then if they were to touch that, that's like... A big federal violation. Right, and and they're 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 not monitored for that on the dredging. I'd just like to respond to your question about the aquifers. Manhattan does get their water from wells, but they're right next to the Blue River, and so really, if you're next to the bank, practically, it's the same water. That it's, it's the same water table. Um, How deep are we around here? Like eighty feet or something? Anybody have any How deep is our water table? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that deep. No, okay. You had a question? Yes, I was wondering as to what watershed data would be available on the website that you guys put together. What watershed data? Yeah, would you have any um, specifics as to the area size and the precipitation rates for e for the area of the entire watershed and how that affects the runoff? Um, the I don't think we have that on there, but it would be something so good to add. That's yeah. right. I mean, but um, and we, we show where your watershed is, so you can kind of look and see where your town is, and it shows you what watershed you're in. Um, because a lot of times, the counties and states and cities, their lines are all straight, and so, so they overlap the watersheds. But this definitely delineates the watersheds and where they are on the Kansas River. And, and right now, it, it's mostly set up for um, non-technical public outreach. But what we're hoping to do with the river inventory is to have a, a deeper layer that will be for technical users. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, and we're working on that. Um, yes. um, when I flooded the river, I did it a couple years ago. We did it in six days. We did the whole thing. Uh, well, you're a uh, young man. <laughs> yeah, or data or yeah. Yeah. But uh, one thing I did notice is like when you're getting to Topeka uh -huh. and by Lawrence, there should be like some big warning flags like to not go yes. over those walls. Yes. yes. We actually took one of our canoes off there. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah, I was yeah, pissed yeah. because they don't have There's any no warning signs. Warning. Yeah, all you, in right Lawrence there. is wonderful signs. Yeah. But yeah, Topeka, Topeka, it could have been our death for sure. Uh, well, and there were a couple deaths recently there, but Topeka's working on that. So they're going to have a lot. They're going to have actually a portage and some access right there at that dam. Flashing lights. And, and they're, they're, yeah, they're going to have. Uh, they are going to have a strobe light, um, and they're going to have lighted signs on the bridge. So, or just something because there's a, such a narrow path that like you have to go so far right. Right. And so well, you, the the rule of thumb on the Kansas River, you always portage on on the left side. Yeah. But I have some things here for you if you're interested. This is on river canoeing. And then I have a few of our newsletters. Um, you can also get this online on our website under news. It's downloadable there. So if there's not enough for everybody, that's fine. Thank you very much. I probably didn't allow enough time for questions. So if you have any burning questions, feel free to come talk to us. And check out the websites. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm grabbing some of these. Oh, go ahead. Ahead. Yeah, because we were concerned, because we were swimming in it a little bit, and we're like, we were wondering if that was bad for us. You know. We didn't do it after Topeka because it was kind of nasty. Uh, and we swam in the river every day, but yeah. I, you know, I purposely don't get my head in mm -hmm. much um, because.